Well, welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm so glad you joined us today. Uh, you might notice that I'm sitting here all by myself. I don't have my, my Brian in the box beside me. Well, if you were watching last week's show, we did a wonderful tribute to Brian as he wraps up his nine years of ministry with 700 Club Canada. And uh, you're going to want to send Brian some love for sure. He's a very busy man. He's got lots of ministry that he does. He's a pastor. He heads up a start to finish charity in Canada and and he finished up his time with 700 Club Canada and we're so thankful for him. Brian and I are good friends of course and I'm wishing Wishing you well, Brian, if you're watching. Uh, so if you want to see that a wonderful tribute, uh, go to 700club.ca. Well, today we're talking about finding purpose. Don't you think that's the number one question? That's what we're all looking for. In fact, I think it's the number one question our culture is asking. What is the purpose or meaning of my life? Because if you don't know the purpose or meaning of your life, you end up feeling very lost, very alone, very isolated. And I think that's where a lot of fear and anxiety comes from. Well, I know as a follower of Jesus, I know where to find the answer to that. It's found in a relationship with Jesus. Because then when you're in relationship with Jesus, you can find the purpose and meaning of your life that you were designed for. You know, if you go and talk to the designer, the designer knows why he designs uh, what he makes. And so God knows better than any of us what we are designed for. That's why we need a relationship with him. And that's what this next story is about. Here's the story of a, a man who was searching for meaning. He was searching for it in knowledge and and education, and all of those things are good, but they'll never find what he found when he looked into the Bible and he found a relationship with God. You're going to be inspired by this. Take a look. I kept asking the question, is there more to life than what I'm seeing? Is there more to life than what the social environment is teaching me? How can I find more meaning, more purpose in my life, in my existence? Dr. Dragos Bratasanu grew up in Romania in the years after the fall of communism. Although he was drawn to various world religions, Christianity was not one of them. I saw people going through the motions of bowing down to the bones of the dead, of going up to light candles for Easter or Christmas, or uh, growing up with the belief that you have to go through the priest if you want to go to the living God. But because of that, because of the religious environment I grew up in, I simply refused to have anything to do with Christianity. Instead, Dragos worshipped knowledge and education. While living in Germany, he received a PhD in satellite-based intelligence studies. I took the path of science, the path of engineering, because this is what the social context was showing me. You have to get a job, cling on to it as hard as possible for as many years as possible. And if you've made it all the way into retirement, you're successful. Dragos excelled in his career and received worldwide acclaim. He studied with NASA and was even featured in National Geographic magazine, but he still was empty inside. I investigated every or almost every spiritual tradition around the world. Because I had put Christianity on the side, I did not want to read the black book with the cross on the cover. His journey took him from the frozen ice caps of the Arctic to the deepest jungles of the Amazon. Across five continents, Dragos searched. So I had spent about seven years um, researching, practicing, meditating, studying all these spiritual traditions. However, the more I studied, the more I could not get to the knowledge of the truth. Almost every area of my life crumbled. My relationship ended after six years. Uh, my startup company didn't work as I was hoping it would work. And it ended up with me in my parents' apartment in depression and such wretched pain. His despair even brought him to the brink of suicide. It got so bad that I was walking past graveyards as I was coming back from work and I was cursing the dead for wanting to be in their place. One evening at his parents' apartment, Dragos decided to pray. The pain was so intense, I just took my pillow and I cried out to God from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of my being. I said, God, if you're real, I need you. You have to come to me because I just cannot do this anymore. 
Shortly after, he called a friend in Hawaii. I flew to Hawaii, and this friend of mine, who wasn't even a Christian, he doesn't believe in the Bible, he said to me, if you, if you have the chance to read something by Catherine Kuhlman, uh, just find the book and read, maybe it will help. I go online, the first book that showed up was called The Greatest Power in the World. I flipped through the, through the pages of this book, and as I read the last row of the foreword that said, if you have not made that full surrender to Jesus Christ, do it now. When my eyes finished reading the sentence, the sentence, I, I felt like an electric shock going through my heart, or as if I was struck by lightning, my knees buckled, I dropped the book in the sink, and I almost went down on the floor. When I got up a second later, I was instantly healed of all guilt, shame, depression. And not only that, but in that moment, I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus Christ is the truth. I had no mental understanding whatsoever about what this means, but I knew beyond any doubt that Jesus Christ is the truth. Dragos then received water baptism. For four months then, I repented of everything I had ever done. And the more I was repenting, the more I was opening up to the Heavenly Father, the more love He poured into me. Today, Dragos wants to show the world through his writing and speaking that science and faith need not be incompatible. The scientific communities have spent more than 40 years looking into near-death experiences. And after studying thousands and thousands of testimonies of near-death accounts, some of the best scientists in the world have come to the understanding and the knowledge that there is an afterlife and heaven and hell are real places. He also says he no longer worships knowledge, but instead, the source of all knowledge, the one who has given his life meaning. The only thing that has purpose for me in this world right now is for him to be pleased with me. All I care is that the one who saved me when I was on the edge of the grave, when I was struggling in despair, he reached down from heaven, he grabbed me, from near death, he put me on the rock, he gave me a new life of hope, of love, of power. Now, all I care is for him to be pleased with me. Jesus Christ, for me, is the beginning and the end, the alpha, the omega, the meaning, the purpose, and the life. Wow, that is quite the dramatic story, isn't it? I really appreciated this testimony because I think this is true of many of us, that we are pursuing, certainly in our culture and in our world, knowledge and understanding. And, you know, there's a, in the Proverbs, actually, the Bible talks about with, without wisdom, knowledge and understanding doesn't take you anywhere. And wisdom is actually God's thoughts on the matter. And that's what Dracos experienced. He had to find a relationship with God. But man, I think he was just so right. He didn't want anything to do with religion. Do you know that Jesus agreed with him? Jesus said, this is not about religion. This is not about rituals and rules. Who needs that in your life? In fact, that sucks the life right out of you. That doesn't give you purpose and meaning. But relationship with Jesus, that's what actually brings life. And that's what Dragos in, in discovered for himself. He had a powerful encounter. Here's Jesus' words in regards to religion versus relationship. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I would suggest that's what religion does. But I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. See, Jesus is the source of life. But how do you find that life? Well, you've got to change your direction. When he talked about his encounter with God, a powerful encounter with God, he used the word repentance. Well, repentance really means a change of mind, a change of direction, a turning around. You turn away from the old direction and you go in the opposite direction, in the new direction. We've got this resource that's simply called repentance and it explains it so well. And it's not a religious word, it's a relationship word. If you want a relationship with Jesus, you need to repent. You just need to turn away from your old thinking and say, a prayer something like this. 
Lord Jesus, I turn away from my old ways, my old thinking, my sin, the things that kept me from you. Forgive me. And I turn to you and I ask you to be Lord and leader of my life. I repent and now I believe in you, Lord Jesus. Come into my life. Amen. If that was you, give us a call. We're here for you. We want you to have new life. I can remember just praying, oh Lord, just let me publish one book, just one book. It's been almost 50 years since best-selling author Debbie Maycomer uttered that prayer. Over 150 books later, millions have turned to her work for stories of love, loss, and hope. I was making up stories when I was four years old. You know, I, I, this is the gift God gave me. He gave me this in creative imagination. Even then, it was unlikely this bright girl from Yakima, Washington, would ever become a best-selling author. Debbie was dyslexic. The third grade teacher told my mother, Debbie's a nice little girl, but she's never gonna do well. I struggled so hard in school, and I had few friends. But a trip with her mother to the yarn store and a knitting class turned her life around. In learning to knit, I learned comprehension skills, math skills. It gave me such a badly needed feeling of accomplishment and self-esteem. It would do more than boost her confidence. Those skills would help Debbie overcome her dyslexia. And by fifth grade, she was reading as well as anyone her age. And I started my first book just about the time I learned to read. I've always loved story. And you know, that's what Jesus did. He taught in stories. And I, you know, he's given me this gift and I have used it to tell stories that hope with of reaching others for him in a, in a subtle and gentle way. Married at 19 to Wayne, Debbie raised four children while trying to fit in as much writing as possible. After years of rejection letters, Debbie picked up freelance magazine work, but she never left her dream of being a published novelist. When you want something so badly, you know, you have to be willing to face rejection. Finally, in 1982, 33-year-old Debbie had her first book published, Heart Song. So for a long time, I felt like I was taking something away from our family. But in retrospect, I was teaching our children some of the most valuable lessons of their lives, you know, about the power of a dream, about believing in yourself, about standing up against rejection, you know, those are all really powerful lessons that they all learned. Since then, 13 of Debbie's novels have reached number one on the New York Times bestsellers list, and six were made into hit movies on the Hallmark Channel, including the ever-popular Cedar Cove series. First of all, the story has to be relevant to my reader. It has to be provocative, because I want the reader to think. It has to be told in the most realistic way I can think to tell it, and that includes conflict. And it has to be done creatively, and it has to be entertaining. I'm not here to teach anybody anything. I ask God to give me the ideas. Every single book has been prayed over. For inspiration, Debbie often pulls from her real life experiences when developing story ideas. Every aspect of my life has been explored in one way or another. I mean, when the kids were little, it was all about raising kids. And, you know, now that I'm a, a mature adult, <laughs> you know, it's more, it's harder for me to write about a 25-year-old falling in love. It's, it's more about relationships and things about real life, like losing your family or starting over again. She believes it's those relatable stories of love, loss, and hope that have earned her so many loyal fans. The only way I can think to explain it is like a spiritual connection, because I know if I laugh when I'm writing a scene, 
the reader will laugh. If I cry, they'll cry. If I lay my heart out on the page, it links with theirs. And they feel like the many letters I get, they feel like they know me and they do because they have read my words. The success and accolades aside, Debbie hopes her words will lead others to another bestseller. One of the, the best uh, letters I ever got from a reader is said, I started reading your books and now I'm reading my Bible. At 70 years old, she's in no hurry to retire. In fact, she just released another novel, Window on the Bay, and another is right behind it, A Mrs. Miracle Christmas. And I've, I've tried to slow down. The hardest part for me in my life right now is balance. I just want to write, you know, I have, if I don't write, I get cranky. And with God's help, write she will. I'm happiest when I'm writing. I mean, I really love what I do. You know, there's that verse in scripture for in Ephesians that said, God will do above and beyond anything you can think or imagine. I'm just leaving it up to him. You know, we are living in unprecedented times. The coronavirus or COVID-19 has run riot across this nation and across the nations of the world. We have seen the devastating effect that this disease has had across our television screens and across our media outlets. And now we're actually entering this time of lockdown, self-isolation, just to try and reduce the curve of the spread. You know, in times like these, all the outward appearances get stripped away. You know, coronavirus is no respecter of age, of gender, nationality, socioeconomic status. Once again, we're all just human beings together. You know, in Psalm 33, it puts it like this. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is vain hope for deliverance. Despite all of its great strength, it cannot save. So in other words, Despite our great endeavors, despite our political strength, our technological advancement, even our economies, we do not have the strength to do this alone. If that's where the story ends, then it's pretty hopeless, right? But the good news is, that isn't where the story ends. You know, as we turn our eyes towards heaven, we reach out to God, we actually find that he's already reaching out to us and he meets us in the time of our need. In the middle of our calamity, he pulls us up. The psalmist continues, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Worship him, trust him, and he will keep you. That's what it says. And you know, as we do this, I truly believe we will see his goodness displayed across our nation, we will see opportunities to share his gospel increase. And actually, we will see the miraculous follow those who believe. You know, in the middle of this COVID-19 outbreak, I pray that this is our statement of intent, that we will wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. God bless you today. Well, I always wanted to serve the Lord and love Him with all my heart. And so my way of doing that, I thought, I would love to be in ministry. I loved writing songs ever since I was little. I thought, what can I do to write songs? I could maybe work in a church and, and I could write songs and do music. 
it was in the winter time. I went to uh, for a walk outside, and it was cold. It was snowy, and I just felt like curling up in the snow and going to sleep. Um, just that low energy, and thinking, okay, maybe I should go to the doctor. Not really. <laughs> she took a blood test, and um, she she called me on the phone and said, "Get to the hospital right away. You probably have leukemia." At that moment, people have the choice whether they could um, you know, shake their fist at God and say, why, how could you do this to me? Why, how could you take away all these things from me? Or you have a, the opportunity to run to God. My husband and I were together, and so we just you know, hugged each other and cried a bit. But the first words I said um, were the words of Job, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. At one point, the doctors kind of threw up their hands and went, we don't know what's going on here. We're not sure why all of this pain is happening. We're not sure what we can do to change it. And so there was one point that the doctors told my husband that I would have three days to live. They said, um, we don't know if this is going to turn around. You know, call the family. We're not sure if she's going to make it. I wasn't prepared for the emotional side of things too because they prepared me really well for all the physical symptoms um, but just emotionally that you just um, but it never crossed my mind that I might die step by step kind of through the journey there was times that um, you know, I was in so much pain in my back um, for different things or just different pain and I would, we would pray and I'd feel it, it would get a little better. So they said, you need a bone marrow tra transplant. Do you have any siblings? No. So they said, well, unrelated donor at the time was a 1 in 20,000 chance of finding a match. From the day in the hospital when I'm, I'm trusting God, I remember just kneeling at my hospital bed that night and I'm all by myself. And um, it, you know, it's, it's evening, it's dark, and I just remember kneeling and, and raising my hands up to the Lord and saying, Father, I just want to worship you with all my heart. I, all of this other stuff I don't care about. I just want to know you. I just want to love you. I felt his peace in such an amazing way. I will never forget that just like, almost like, and I can breathe again. I was like, okay, thank you, Lord, that you're walking me through. Um, there was a man that was praying for me at the same time, and it's, um, it was just by telephone. He wasn't even there. Um, and he, he said, no, I feel like God's telling me that in three days she's going to start to get better. And that's actually what happened. In three days was when I started to sit up. I like to say God had an answer. He had a bone marrow donor that had signed up on the Red Cross International Registry um, before that, and he was a perfect match. My donor's name is Andy, and he lives in England. He's a computer teacher at a low-income school, and um, his wife is a special needs um, worker, and they're just kind-hearted people, and um, I think very unassuming. How do you say thank you to somebody who saves your life? You know, though you walk through darkness, though you walk through shadow, you're never alone. The God who made the universe knows your name. The love that made the roses bloom unfolds your dreams, and he, he sees every fear in your eyes. You're never alone. I don't know if there has ever been a time when our nation and the world needed a miracle more than we do right now. Get Pat Robertson's latest DVD, Do You Need a Miracle? In this DVD, you'll discover God's awesome power at work today, featuring incredible true stories of divine intervention. God showed up and he worked miracles. Different doctors would come in and it's like, wow, you're a miracle. I knew God had restored him. We've also gathered teachings that will be especially helpful to you with what we're facing today. Why it's so important to believe God and build our faith. And this program is going to help you do just that. Conquer fear, find hope, and be encouraged. Get Do You Need a Miracle? Available now.
Well, it's been an inspiring show today. And, and you know what? We just got some, always are getting great, uh, you know, just comments from our viewers, which so encourages us. And one of the recent comments uh, that often comes up is that our testimonials really inspire and grow faith. And, you know, that's what this show's about. We want to inspire you to grow in faith, to trust God more. I mean, do you trust God with every part of your life? That's why we do this every day. And we ask you know, regularly because we need regular ongoing support. Those monthly donors, especially, that are giving $20 a month or your best gift in order to help this ministry because we want people to grow in faith. So if that's you, you think, oh, you know, she's talking to someone else. No, I'm talking to you. Would you give us a call right now, 1-855-759-0700 and say, yes, I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to help you tell more inspiring stories, the good news of Jesus across our nation so that people can grow in faith. Uh, we would love to thank you with a gift. Do you need a miracle? It's a wonderful teaching DVD. So give us a call today, partner with us, and together we can continue to grow people's faith. But I want to pray for some people now because we've got prayer requests all the time that are coming in, and we'd love to pray for you. Beatrice is, we're praying for her niece. She has a three-year-old niece who has kidney failure. So she's on dialysis and needing a, a supernatural healing and full recovery. So we're going to pray for your niece, Beatrice. And a Celestina has been praying for um, to be married to a godly man. And I think that's a good prayer request. So let me pray. You join with me now. Father, I pray for Beatrice and her little three-year-old niece, and we pray that even now you would come so close to this little girl, that you would touch her with your almighty power, Lord Jesus, and that she would have a miraculous recovery because of the powerful name of Jesus. And I pray for Celestina, for her prayer request for a godly man, and for those that are seeking a spouse, I pray that you would order their steps, Lord, that you would unite hearts together to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we can pray about anything and everything, and I've seen God answer prayer every day in my life because he's good and trustworthy. So I encourage you to pray, take everything to God. You'll find your purpose and meaning when you talk to him about everything. Thanks for watching today. We love you. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates Incorporated, The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S 4T4. Visit us at 700club.ca or check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.